Black hole singularities break physics. Fortunately, the universe seems to conspire to protect itself from their causality-destroying madness. At least, so says the cosmic censorship hypothesis. Only problem is that many physicists are coming to think that might be wrong and that naked singularities may exist after all. Strange things happen inside black holes. Space and time switch roles, pathways open to other universes, and in some cases, time travel becomes possible. Causality breaks down. And so the supreme sensibleness of physics is badly threatened. And surrounding all of this weirdness is the event horizon, the surface around the central singularity where the inward flow of space reaches the speed of light, and time freezes from the perspective of the outside universe. In the most real possible sense, the interior of the black hole is its own separate space-time, excised from our universe. The event horizon sounds dire, but it's a blessing. Without it, the infinitely dense singularity and its surrounding madness is exposed to the outside universe. We would have what we call a naked singularity. This would wreak havoc on our understanding of causality and our precious laws of physics would become unhinged. Given the dire consequences, Roger Penrose proposed the cosmic censorship hypothesis, which basically states that every gravitational singularity must be surrounded by an event horizon. In an upcoming episode, we're going to look deeper at why many physicists believe the cosmic censorship hypothesis must be true, even without knowing exactly why it's true, and we'll see why other physicists have begun to doubt its validity. But today, we're going to look at the astrophysics and see how exactly a naked singularity might be formed in the first place, and how the universe seems to work very hard to protect itself from them. So let's talk about how to dissolve an event horizon, although I would ask you to please not try this at home for the sake of all of physics. According to the so-called no-hair theorem, black holes can have only three properties, mass, electric charge, and spin. Mass is what makes a black hole a black hole, and so the simplest black holes have only this property. These are Schwarzschild black holes, and with only mass, that means they also have inward pulling gravity. With nothing to counter the inward flow of space, an event horizon is inevitable. In recent episodes, we also explored the rotating or Kerr black hole. Inside, we found that the rapid rotation has spun the point-like singularity into a ring of infinite density. The time machine is on the other side of that ring, by the way. The same rotation that forms the ring also drags the fabric of space into a vortex, which counters the inward pull due to the singularity's mass. The result is that we get this region around the singularity where the faster-than-light inward flow of space is halted. It's like the eye of the storm, and it's separated from the surrounding cascade by the inner event horizon. As the spin of a Kerr black hole increases, the space-time waterfall is beaten back, and so the inner horizon grows. At a certain very high rotation rate, the inner and outer horizons merge, which means they both vanish. There's no longer a region where the inward flow of space exceeds light speed. Instead, there's a smooth run of normal, albeit rapidly spinning space, all the way down to the singularity ring, the naked singularity ring. There's a similar situation with the charged black hole, which, absent rotation, is described by the Reisner-Nordstrom metric. The presence of electric charge at the central singularity, which is still point-like in this case, results in a negative pressure that again resists the inward pull of gravity. Reisner Nordstrom black holes also have an inner horizon, interior to which space and time seem normal-ish. The more electric charge you drop into a black hole, the larger its inner horizon becomes. And just as with the rotating black hole, at some point the inner and outer horizons become one and vanish, and you're left with a naked singularity. At the tipping point, when the inner and outer horizons are right next to each other, you have what we call an extremal black hole. A black hole with the maximum amount of spin or charge while still having an event horizon. 
In both cases, the amount of angular momentum or charge that you can fit into the black hole before it becomes extremal depends on its mass. More mass means more inward gravity and so the black hole can hold more spin and charge before going extremal. So that is how you make an extremal black hole or even perhaps a naked singularity. Just add enough spin or charge to an existing black hole. And actually, there is another way to do this in the case of charged black holes. Normal black holes leak away their mass by emitting Hawking radiation. That radiation can be any type of elementary particle. But in the case of the most massive black holes, it's mostly just photons. That's because the more massive the black hole, the lower the temperature of the radiation. In very massive black holes, the Hawking radiation has trouble mustering the energy to make anything but weak photons. So that means a massive charged black hole will slowly leak away its mass while retaining its charge. The outer event horizon will shrink until it meets the inner horizon and again you have an extremal black hole. This can't happen with rotating black holes because they leak away their angular momentum as well as their mass. Once you have an extremal black hole by whatever method, it lasts for a very, very long time, if not forever. Hawking radiation is a direct result of there being an event horizon. So naked singularities don't Hawking radiate and extremal black holes radiate only very slowly. That leaves us with a strange situation. In the far distant future, even if all particles in the universe decay, we may be left with only radiation and these naked charged singularities. So there we have a few recipes for theoretical disaster. At first glance, it appears that extremal black holes are certainly possible. So why shouldn't it be possible to add a little more spin or charge to produce true naked singularities? The cosmic censorship hypothesis tells us that something will always stop a gravitational singularity being stripped of its event horizon. But it doesn't tell us the physical mechanism. Let's look at what we know. Rotating black holes gain their angular momentum from things they swallow. Stuff doesn't normally fall straight into a black hole, it spirals in as its orbit decays. It's that orbital angular momentum that is fed to the black hole. But in order for an object orbiting a black hole to fall into it, it actually has to lose some of that angular momentum, otherwise it would just keep orbiting forever. For example, if there's a disk of gas surrounding the black hole, like in a quasar, then the gas only spirals inwards because angular momentum is carried outwards by friction. By the time the gas reaches the black hole, it has lost much of the angular momentum it started with. And the faster the black hole is rotating, the more angular momentum the gas has to lose in order to fall in. That's because space gets dragged around a rotating black hole, giving the gas a sort of boost, so it can still orbit even with very little of its own angular momentum. In the case of an extremal Kerr black hole, one that's rotating nearly fast enough to lose its event horizon, the gas near the event horizon orbits entirely riding on the carousel of frame dragged space and has no angular momentum of its own. Therefore, just on the verge of becoming extremal, the black hole can't gain spin from accretion anymore. More generally, there is no trajectory into an extremal rotating black hole that can add angular momentum from the trajectory or the orbit itself. An alternative is to throw in something that's actually spinning itself so it has intrinsic angular momentum. It's not yet clear whether we can avoid the naked singularity in this case. At any rate, our observations of gravitational waves from colliding black holes and various other methods for estimating black hole spin have not yet revealed a single black hole with a spin high enough to be super extremal. For charged black holes, the situation is in some ways easier, but it has its own weirdness. We don't actually expect real astrophysical black holes to retain any significant charge. A charged black hole in the vicinity of any matter would repel like charges and attract and swallow opposite charges and so quickly neutralize. But imagine we create a charged black hole and isolate it from all other matter. Then surely we can just throw charged particles into the black hole. We have to be careful because those particles increase the mass of the black hole as well as its charge and if the mass increases too much it won't go extremal. But electrons 
they have very tiny masses for comparatively large charge. Just factoring the electron's mass, it should be easy to send a black hole over the extremal limit by feeding it a stream of electrons. But here we get to something that seems a bit too neat to be a coincidence. As Einstein taught us, mass and energy are equivalent. There's an enormous amount of energy in the electric field of all of those electrons that you smoosh together into the black hole. In fact, the field itself will always generate enough mass to prevent the black hole from losing its event horizon. Once again, the universe appears to have a mechanism to avoid the naked singularity. But there still isn't an underlying understanding of why, or even if, cosmic censorship must be maintained. In fact, if you define the cosmic censorship hypothesis in more technical terms, it seems that physics should allow its violation. And that would be a big problem for physics. To really understand that problem and the implications of the cosmic censorship hypothesis being true or not, you'll have to wait for an upcoming deeper dive to witness the horrors of the cosmically uncensored space-time. We missed comment responses last week, so today we're covering two episodes, Building Black Holes in the Lab with Analog Event Horizons and Roger Penrose's Conformal Cyclic Cosmology. Moksha Prasunath and Kay Fitz have related questions on representing black holes graphically. In representations of black holes as funnels or wormholes as tubes, what does that funnel or tube really represent? Is it, for example, some extra dimension that the black hole leads into? Well, actually, in those representations, we take three-dimensional space and take a two-dimensional slice out of it. So the black hole or wormhole ends are circular instead of spherical. Then, the third dimension is just a way to represent the strength of the spatial curvature and the connections between different regions. In the case of the black hole funnel, moving towards the bottom means moving towards the central singularity, and the narrowing of the funnel represents extremely curved space-time. Each ring that you pass as you go down the funnel represents crossing a 3D spherical shell. As you approach the singularity, you end up being wrapped entirely around that shell. In the case of the tube between wormhole ends, traveling along the wall of the tube would feel like traveling through a 3D space, but if you travel around the tube, you get back to where you started. These representations are called embedding diagrams, and we went through them in detail in our recent episode on wormholes. Okay. Onto conformal cyclic cosmology, in which the Big Bang is hypothesized to be the rescaled infinite late time forever of a previous universe, leading to a potentially endless chain of universes or aeons. Benno Hourglass asks for confirmation of his interpretation of conformal cyclic cosmology. Is the space between the atoms in one aeon infinite from the point of view of observers from the previous aeon? Well, the answer is essentially yes. Each new infinitesimally small Big Bang corresponds not just to the very, very large late time of the previous universe, but actually to the conformal infinity of the previous. So all the future infinite time of the previous universe added together. Inayo Bill asks if we're assuming that the lightest particles are without dimension so that they have undefined size relative to the universe. Well, I think that's the idea, yes. A point-like particle has size zero, and that's zero volume, zero radius. It has the same relative size compared to the universe, whether that universe is trillions of light years across or a millimeter across. But that's not enough to make the universe scale invariant. Electrons, for example, supposedly have zero size, but they also have something called an interaction cross-section, which defines the probability of another particle interacting with the electron as a function of distance from that electron. And that's kind of another type of size, and it makes a big difference if you're a millimeter away from an electron versus a trillion light years. In the case of a universe full of photons, 
I think the idea is that when you rescale both space and time by the same factor, you also rescale the interaction probability so that the interaction rate scales in the same way. So a pair of photons one light second apart have the same probability of interacting over one second as do a pair of photons a billion light years apart over a billion years. But I'm gonna to have to dig deeper on that one myself. If anyone knows, please shout out in the comments. I mentioned that in conformal cyclic cosmology, photons and gravitational waves can pass the boundary from one universe end to the new Big Bang. And so there may be a way to send messages between these universes. Many of you had a guess at what we might read imprinted on the cosmic microwave background from the previous Aeon. Here are some of my favorites. We've been trying to reach you about your car's expiring warranty. Smedjip was here. Hey folks, enjoy your entropy while it's low. And a gratifying number of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy references. The answer is 42. We apologize for the inconvenience and goodbye and thanks for all the fish.